Hello, I'm Joe Honeyhockey. If you're familiar at all with the Catholic Church, you know that we really like the saints, and with good reason. The saints were regular people that surrendered themselves totally to God, and in turn, he blessed them with heroic virtue in order to accomplish many great things. They are living examples of how God can transform the hearts of even the most ardent of sinners. As such, they inspire hope in each of us who might be going through a difficult time or experiencing doubt in God's plan. They are a living reminder that it is God who provides and become examples of what it looks like to surrender our hearts to Him. And they're certainly still active in our lives. They desire to be our friends and allies. It isn't like they've distanced themselves from us to celebrate their entry into heaven, but rather they're continually engaged with us as we are all part of this mystical community that is Christ's body. They've already been through life, they've encountered our struggles, but are now in a position of unbounded union with the Lord. So you can bet that they'll use that position to joyfully present requests on our behalf. We as humans thrive in community, both physically and spiritually. So to that end, I welcome you to the Heavenly Social, where I will introduce you to our saintly brothers and sisters, a friend you can reach out to when times are tough, or you just need some encouragement. So, to that end, have you ever lost anything? Well, if you've grown up Catholic, you might know where I'm taking this, as I can guarantee you've heard of this saint. But, do you actually know who he is? Well, let me introduce you to Saint Anthony of Padua. And intro tune. Growing up, I was always told to pray to St. Anthony whenever I wanted to find something I had lost, but little did I realize there was more than one St. Anthony. So, who the heck was I talking to? Well, the Anthony that everyone associates with the patronage of lost items is none other than St. Anthony of Padua. So, in addition to lost things, he also bears the patronage of quite a few other things. Mariners, sailors, fishermen. Uh, he's the patron against shipwreck. He's the patron uh, against sterility. He is the patron for expectant mothers, the elderly, and counter-revolutionaries. I kind of like that last one, just given what uh, we Catholics and Christians uh, are facing in today's culture. All right, so why is St. Anthony a patron of these things, you might be asking? Well... I'm here to help you out. So, here is the story of our dear St. Anthony of Padua. Our story takes us to Lisbon, Portugal, in the year 1195, August 15th, to be exact, where the cries of a newborn baby boy rang out. The name of this baby boy was Fernando Martin. Ah, you weren't expecting that now, were you? <laughs> Well, I, I suppose if you're already familiar with his story, then you probably were expecting that. But I digress. Now, young Fernando was born into a wealthy family, and as such, he was set up to receive a proper education fit for a noble of the time. When he was 15, he entered the community of Canons Regular at the Augustinian Abbey of St. Vincent in Lisbon. Two years later, in 1212, when he was 17 years old, he requested he be transferred to the Abbey of Santa Cruz in Coimbra. Why? <laughs> because he was distracted by the frequent visits from friends and family. He received permission from his superior to transfer, and so he journeyed to Coimbra, where he spent eight years of prayer and study. Now, it seems he was blessed with a rather extraordinary memory, and was gifted with a deep understanding of his studies. Following these eight years of academic excellence, and eventually being placed in charge of hospitality, it was January 16th of 1220 that our young Fernando 
now only in his 25th year. 25th year? Why, why would I phrase it like that? And now, only 25 years of it. Goodness, that's not any better. Now 25 years old. There we go. Witnessed a sight most nowadays would consider horrifying. He witnessed the bodies of five Franciscan martyrs. Now, time for a quick aside regarding these martyrs. The Franciscan order was founded uh, very recently, so it, it was fairly new. It had only been around for about 10 years or so at this point. So these five men, these five martyrs, uh, were among the first members of the order. Now, specifically, these five men, they traveled to the Muslim-dominated Morocco to evangelize, uh, but they were imprisoned and tortured, and then eventually beheaded by the Moorish king when they refused to renounce their faith in Christ. So their, their bodies were returned to Portugal, where they were transported by procession to Assisi. Uh, through this, these five men, uh, their names being uh, Barard of Carbio, Peter, Otto, uh, Acursius, and uh, Ajudas. They, so they became the Franciscan proto-martyrs, meaning that they were the first Franciscans to be killed for their faith. And uh, their feast day is now celebrated on January 16th uh, within the, the Franciscan order. Okay, so with that little bit of context, it was these five proto-martyrs that Fernando greeted as they rested there in Santa Cruz Monastery on their way to Assisi. So upon seeing their bodies, knowing they had sacrificed themselves in order to bring Christ to the ignorant, a fire ignited within the young man, and he was filled with a desire to also become a martyr. So he resolved to join the Franciscans, so he could also venture to the land where these five proto-martyrs lost their lives. Right, so with permission, he left the canons regular of St. Augustine and joined the Order of Friars Minor, a.k.a. the Franciscans. Upon doing this, he took the name of Anthony, named after St. Anthony the Great. What was the, the first thing our impassioned Anthony did upon joining the New Order? Well, he made his way from Morocco. But God had other plans. And Anthony became too sick to travel for that entire winter. So the following spring, so this would be the year uh, 1221, he set sail for Portugal, but his ship got caught up in a terrible storm, and he wound up in Sicily, where his Franciscan brothers took care of him in Messina. So, yeah, here's where that, that, that patronage of, uh, you know, against shipwrecks and mariners, yeah, that's where this came in. While he recovered, he heard that a general chapter was going to be held in Assisi for the Franciscans uh, on May 30th. Well, he managed to attend and uh, applied to serve under one Father Graziano, who was the provincial of Coimbra. Now, if you're like me and didn't know what a provincial was, uh, they're basically like a regional manager. Uh, you have a superior general whose authority is over the whole religious order, and then you have a provincial superior whose authority is over, surprise, surprise, a province. And then you have your local superiors. All right, so with that clarification, to reiterate, Anthony applied to serve under the provincial of Coimbra, conveying the desire to fully live the Franciscan life and spirituality, uh, but he neglected to mention any of his past theological education. He was accepted and stationed at the Hermitage at uh, Monte Paolo. Well, while he... Uh, lived a quiet and contemplative life there, he had the opportunity to attend the ordination of several Franciscan and Dominican friars in the town of Forley. And wouldn't you know it, no one had been asked to preach. With no one prepared, no one wanted to speak. So St. Anthony was graciously volunteered by his superior. Out of obedience, he did so. 
Now, it's important to note that nobody really had any expectations of him. Remember, he neglected to mention any of his past education, so they thought he was uneducated. And, uh, well, as it goes, he began pretty timidly, as I'm sure any of us who isn't very well prepared or doesn't exactly like public speaking uh, would start. But then the Holy Spirit took the reins and lit the fire of passion within him, and all that were present were struck by how profound of an understanding this young man had about Holy Scripture and uh, the doctrine. And, well, that's how St. Anthony got noticed. This is why we know who St. Anthony is. If it hadn't been for the fact that someone forgot to prepare a preacher for the ordination ceremony, we very well might not know who St. Anthony is today. Because afterward, after this event, in 1224, upon hearing of him, St. Francis sent Anthony a letter requesting that he teach theology to his fellow brothers, on the condition, and I quote here, that the spirit of prayer and devotion might not be extinguished, end quote. Anthony accepted. But it was apparent that his greatest gifts weren't so much in theology as they were in preaching. As such, he became a traveling preacher, going head-to-head -head with heretics and offering correction to those who would otherwise go astray in the faith. He was so passionate and effective at communicating with the ordinary person that he had been given the title Hammer of Heretics. It was during these public years that God worked many miracles through Anthony. One such event took place when a group of heretics tried to poison him, but the poisoned food was rendered safe when he blessed it. There was also a very well-known story of Anthony's Book of Psalms that was stolen by a novice, and uh, upon praying for its return, the thief was overcome with remorse and not only returned the book, but returned to the order as well. Hence, his patronage of lost things. There are many, many more stories of the miracles of St. Anthony, and I highly encourage you to check them out. But he was able to do so many incredible things in really just a matter of a few years. So you remember how I mentioned Anthony got started in 1224, well, our Anthony fell ill seven years later in 1231 and died on June 13th of that year. It was a year later that he was declared a saint by Pope Gregory IX, who had actually known St. Anthony. He had the pleasure of listening to St. Anthony preach and, uh, in fact, Pope Gregory IX referred to Anthony as the Ark of the Testament because he was able to just move so many hearts with his words and his understanding of the gospel. As I reflected on St. Anthony's life, uh, the virtue that stood out to me the most was his obedience to his superiors. Obviously, a saint such as Anthony exudes numerous virtues, uh, but as I said, to me, it's his obedience that stands out as particularly incredible. Now, considering all those who enter a religious community or holy orders uh, take a vow of obedience, it makes me curious as to why that stood out to me. Well, in reading the rule of St. Francis, uh, which is, as you might imagine, the foundational guidelines the Franciscan order is built upon, it's filled with references to obedience, and I believe the reason being is that St. Francis understood the importance of structure in striving for heaven, and an inherent element to keeping a sound structure is obedience to one's superior. Now, a surface-level glance at rules like this uh, might seem almost tyrannical, but one look at St. Francis' life will show that he lived as he expected his subordinates to live, and illustrates that obedience is, is actually 
a key ingredient to sanctification. If we are to serve God, then we must be obedient to his will. It would make sense to practice obedience whenever possible. Uh, whether it be towards our boss, our spouse, parents, or really anyone with a legitimate authority over us. So that when the moment arrives and the Holy Spirit speaks to our hearts, we might be able to accept such promptings heroically. Well, because of how important obedience is, uh, there is so much more that could be said. But bringing this back to Anthony... I believe he was drawn to the Franciscan order uh, because of how much of an emphasis they placed on this virtue. Virtues are gifts from God, and we achieve sainthood, total union with him, when we cooperate with the gifts he has given us. So, following that logic, we achieve sainthood when we cooperate with these virtues. With that said, it seems clear to me that St. Anthony's obedience to his proper superiors and to the will of God was a special virtue given to him. And in allowing God to guide him along the path to utilize this gift, even more gifts were then allotted to him, such as the gift of eloquence. In fact, his eloquence is legendary. And his faithful preaching and witness to the Christian life was impactful to the point where he was named a doctor of the church on January 16th, 1946. You can find collections of his sermons online, which had been compiled by Anthony during his lifetime. So to close things out, I'd like to share with you a little poem credited to St. Anthony that many of you might be familiar with or have heard before, <laughs> but I just happen to really like it a lot and think the message is too phenomenal not to share. So without further ado, here is Be Satisfied With Me. Everyone longs to give themselves completely to someone, to have a deep soul relationship with another, to be loved thoroughly and exclusively. But God to a Christian says, No, not until you are satisfied, fulfilled and content with being loved by me alone, with giving yourself totally and unreservedly to me, with having an intensely personal and unique relationship with me alone, discovering that only in me is your satisfaction to be found, will you be capable of the perfect human relationship that I have planned for you. You will never be united with another until you are united with me alone, exclusive of anyone or anything else, exclusive of any other desires or longings. I want you to stop planning, stop wishing, and allow me to give you the most thrilling plan existing. One that you cannot imagine. Please allow me to bring it to you. You just keep watching me, expecting the greatest things. Keep experiencing the satisfaction that I am. Keep listening and learning the things I tell you. You just wait. That's all. Don't be anxious. Don't worry. Don't look at the things you think you want. You just keep looking off and away, up to me. Or you'll miss what I want to show you. And then, when you are ready, I'll surprise you with a love far more wonderful than any you could dream of. You see, until you are ready... And until the one I have for you is ready, I am working even at this moment to have you both ready at the same time. Until you are both satisfied exclusively with me and the life I prepared for you, you won't be able to experience the love that exemplified your relationship with me. And this is the perfect love. 
And, dear one, I want you to have this most wonderful love. I want you to see in the flesh a picture of your relationship with me, and to enjoy materially and concretely the everlasting union of beauty, perfection, and love that I offer you with myself. Know that I love utterly. I am God. Believe it, and be satisfied. While the overall passage certainly lends itself more to those of us who might be single and longing for marriage, I find the core message applicable to all of us. So, let us ask our dear friend St. Anthony to pray for us, that we may achieve total satisfaction in God alone and his love for us. Well, and with that, this episode has come to a close. Keep up your prayers, and one day somebody might tell your saintly story. Until then, farewell. And outro tune. As I reflected on St. Anthony... <sighs> oh. Whew. All right. Episode one down. Now time to celebrate with a nice ice-cold beer. You know, this actually gets me thinking. Gets me thinking about a particular saint the patron saint of brewers. And no, I'm not talking about Augustine, so you'll just have to stay tuned and find out next time. <laughs> See ya!